have, have we lost the minimum connection? Audible. You are audible, ma'am. Minimum, you are audible, audible. Okay. My connection got lost, I think. So. Okay. Yeah. So. So I think uh, now I I can hand over session to Mr. Avinash Sharma. Just a second, I will uh, open up. Avinash sir, you can present your PPT now. You have been made as a presenter here. Uh, yeah, can you guys hear me? Ah, yeah, you are audible, sir. You are audible. Yes, sir, you are very much audible, sir. Okay, I'll uh, start the presentation. Just a minute. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, sir. It is visible. Okay. Yep. It is visible. Uh, so uh, I will be presenting on. Uh, yes, sir. It various... is visible, sir. Yes, sir. So I I work as a senior imaging scientist at uh, a company in uh, Montreal called Alcolux, uh, where we uh, basically work on various uh, computer vision and. Uh, human vision uh, applications uh, for camera systems and uh, design various uh, computer vision algorithms uh, for various uh, uh, tier two companies, tier two camera and car, uh, car manufacturing companies. There. Uh, so today I'll be presenting uh, on some of the algorithms that uh, we were work out there for uh, automatically optimizing the uh, camera systems. Uh, end to end with the uh, uh, says we use uh, the, the same cameras that we use for human vision for uh, computer vision applications like object detection uh, for street, uh, for a self driving car uh, where the camera is also used for pedestrian car traffic light traffic sign detections uh, so generally uh, most uh, cameras nowadays that we use everywhere are optimized for uh, by expert uh, experts for human vision tasks. Uh, but for uh, a lot of times, uh, the way those tuning are done for the cameras are not optimal for uh, for some safety critical tasks like uh, like object detection in a self driving car. So for, for for this whole lecture, we will first start with uh, some explanations of how what a, a camera image processing pipeline looks like, uh, and uh, we'll start with some uh, uh, some very basic uh, basic components of a camera uh, camera pipeline itself, and then we will move on to uh, different applications uh, for for the uh, for a general general camera systems. And uh, how, what what's the current uh, use cases like? How the subsystems in that camera are optimized uh, in the industry, and uh, some new uh, algorithms and frameworks that uh, are being researched right now on uh, on fully automatic uh, automating the end to end pipeline, uh, where we will uh, I will show some examples of where we do the ISP optimization along with the uh, CV model fine tuning that are done uh, in an end to end fashion. So, just for an overview of uh, what a camera is. To uh, the, uh, measure the light, uh, light rays and uh, get a scene of the real world, uh, get a digital image of the real world uh, scenes. So let, for a basic, very, very basic camera, we can assume that 
let's say there's no lens, uh, ju there's just a sensor, uh, sensor plane here, and it's only made, the only thing it's doing is measuring all the, there are various uh, pixels in this sensor plane, where it's only where it's measuring all the light uh, coming from various sources uh, on it. In this case, the same point will also will be measured everywhere with different uh, intensity on this plane. Obviously, as this is close to this point, the light intensity will be higher uh, here compared to the other points. But more or less, uh, it would be measured everywhere. And uh, what you will get is a, a very blurry image with, uh, with same colors everywhere because basically all the light rays are uh, going to all the pixels of this on this image plane. One basic way to improve that would be uh, to introduce a pinhole camera where we only uh, take the images, uh, only take the light rays uh, passing through this pinhole. So in this case, uh, you will get this inverted image on this sensor plane. But there are some problems in if we do it like that. Uh, we can assume a very large uh, pinhole size. In that case, what will happen? You can assume this to be an infinite size pinhole because uh, like if you make this uh, hole very large up to infinity, it's basically like that. And you will, as, as, the, as the pinhole size would get larger, you will get more and more geometric blur here. In other case, uh, you can have a very small uh, pinhole where due to the size of this hole being very small, you will see a lot of diffract diffraction of these light rays. And uh, that will also cause, because uh, the light will uh, from at the edges will get diffracted almost everywhere with different intensities and you will get a diffraction blaze blur. But if you have like uh, an optimal uh, size of the pinhole, uh, although you will get a decent image, but the amount of light that this uh, hole will capture, because you can assume this, there's a lot of light that's coming from everywhere, but we are only capturing the light that's passing through here. The amount of light captured by on the sensor plane would be very low. So you will get a lot of noise as well uh, as uh, the uh, in the data captured, the information cap, uh, captured on the image plane, the sensor plane here uh, would be very low even in that case. Now the way to improve that would be to introduce a lens in front of the sensor plane uh, where we will uh, basically cap uh, uh, deflect all the lights at different parts of the lens towards uh, at different points on the sensor plane. And in that case, we are able to actually get a lot of light. Uh, and if you compare the images here, you can clearly see like there's a lot, it's, if you look at this, uh, the sand part of things, there's a lot more detail here. This part is a lot more blurry when we were using a small pinhole here compared to what we get with the lens. Uh, that's where uh, we get, uh, uh, we can introduce the whole uh, camera pipeline. So in the real world, uh, we, we have like a 280 uh, decibels of data uh, of light intensity uh, that the camera system has to deal with. This, the light, the light from various light sources on, in the real world scene uh, pass through optics, which is measure the, the light intensity uh, at different uh, points on the image plane are measured af uh, after passing through the optics, uh, which gives us a, a 20 stop, uh, a low light intensity uh, raw HDR image. Even here, 20 stops, 120 dB is uh, very large. Generally, when we deal with the uh, displays, 
uh, what we see in monitors is like a like bit image which generally tends to be like uh, 10 uh, decibel 8 decibel there but uh, this 20 decibel here is between 20 to 24 uh, bits of data which is still huge the isp uh, th then there's uh, after that uh, the sensor uh, the sensor raw data is then passed through a uh, image signal processor which uh, does uh, which does a lot of uh, apply a lot of algorithms uh, for denoising demosaicing and uh, on the raw image data to convert it into rgb one an another thing that is does throughout the pipeline is basically it will compress the data into something that is useful for uh, the human viewing or uh, for, for the end user or for computer vision. In LDR case, which are, which are most of the cameras that we use, uh, we, generally the data is six to eight bit or at best 10 bits here. Uh, in, in HDR case, uh, it may be 12 bits or, or 14 bits, but uh, generally, uh, the the number of uh, the information after the ISP that we display on our monitors or we pass through the computer vision algorithms is much lower uh, in terms of uh, the data range it covers compared to the real life scene, which is like 280 decibel, and you can clearly see like this a lot of compression throughout this pipeline. So it's very uh, necessary to optimize uh, uh, to get to get uh, the ISP configuration into something uh, that's uh, that preserves more most of the in, important information within the, from the data that the sensor captured, and that information the usefulness of the information can be different for uh, for a human. Uh, viewer compared to what a uh, computer vision algorithm might want. So the first part in the camera imaging pipeline, uh, the lens is itself can be uh, very complex. It, it, in most of the cameras, it's not single lens uh, system there, the single optic lens there. The, generally the lens system there are contains various uh, optics there. And that also introduces many problems. One of the problem is uh, chromatic aberration. Uh, different uh, colors in the light are uh, diffracted with uh, at different angles. So what you can get is for the same source, you can get blue color in at that point, green color at different point and red color at different point. To solve this, one of the ways to do that would be to uh, to uh, to make a multi uh, to use multiple lenses or uh, to use a hybrid uh, lens with a multiple focal lens. Uh, one of them is called achromatic doublet, which uses uh, double lenses there to do double diffraction so that the light rays are focused at the same point for all the, all the different colors here. The other uh, artifact that uh, lens system generally introduces is uh, lens distortion. This, uh, the lens distortion can be of two types, pin cushion and barrel distortion. Uh, this generally occurs due to uh, magnification, different magnification uh, of, the, of the data as we move away from the center of the lens. So in case of pin cushion distortion, the data away from the center is magnified much more. If you look here, the actual data is this square, but this edge is getting distorted into. Uh, much larger length here. In other case, there could be barrel distortion, 
uh, where uh, the magnification becomes lower as we move away from the center of the optics. Uh, some of this distortion can be uh, rectified in the IS pipeline itself or with a better design lenses. Another artifact that are generally introduced by lens system is called vignette. So if you uh, look at a general lens here, the, at the image plane, uh, on this image plane, the images at the edges of, of the lenses have to travel, the light rays have to travel much more to reach this point compared to the center. This causes a uh, lot less light to be uh, captured as we move away from the center of the image. As you can see in this image, it's a lot more darker at the edges of the, the on the image plane. Another uh, thing that can introduce uh, some sort of vignetting there could be the shape of the lens itself where or the shape of uh, of the uh, the camera device itself where uh, the, generally there's some uh, sort of a covering outside of the lens that is used and uh, some of the light can get diffracted at uh, at the edge of that curve and that can also introduce uh, some sort of vignetting in the on the image plane. And th this uh, one way to rectify this problem is uh, to basically capture a white image uh, where you can see the uh, clear vignetting and apply some gains in the, in the ISP uh, to uh, get rid of most of its effect. The second component of the camera subsystem is a sensor which is which basically measures the light and converts it into some sort of digital information so what uh, what uh, sensor captures are basically photons at, at different locations on the pixel on, on the sensor plane and the first part of the sensor converts that those photons into electrons and th those uh, with, uh, using a photodiode after the photodiode, generally there are multiple uh, capacitors uh, within us for each photodiode, which uh, basically convert uh, those electrons into some voltage uh, electrical signal. And uh, as this uh, voltage signal is uh, continuous is na in nature, and what we want at the end uh, is a digital signal, uh, we uh, use analog to digital uh, converter to get the final digital data for each pixel on the sensor plane. One of the artifacts that uh, common sensors can introduce is uh, anti-aliasing. Well, one way to solve that anti-aliasing, uh, if you look at the center of uh, this equipment here on the edges, you can see if you can, you can see these lines here. The edges are not clear where they're going. There you can see some blending from here. One way to rectify for that could be to use a low pass filter uh, before the sensor and uh, within the sensor there, which can uh, remove some of the uh, high frequency data from the. Uh, signal. And in that way, you can rectify for most of the anti aliasing. The other component of the sensor, the one main component is basically analog to digital conversion. And this uh, basically kept in the end that uh, it encodes the uh, photons that sensor captures into some digital value, which can range from uh, 10 bits in the in a, a very low end LDR sensor, uh, up to 24 bits in high end HDR sensors like IMX490. Uh, 
some sensors also have uh, some digital gain uh, within the, uh, applied within uh, the sen for each photodiode. Sometimes uh, the sensor in in low low light uh, low, low light scenes, it's not able to uh, capture a lot of data, and uh, applying a gain uh, amplification in the AD conversion uh, can help out with that with capturing some of the details in the uh, dark areas in the image. But that also uh, when whenever you apply uh, same digital gain throughout the image, it also amplifies the noise in the image. And uh, if the uh, if for some pixels, the value uh, uh, is very near the saturation point, applying a gain uh, could saturate a lot more points there. And this could lead to, you can see here, that in the dark areas, the noise is quite a lot, but in, in the in the whiter regions here, a lot of detail is gone because many of the pixels are basically saturated to highest value. Some other common uh, artifacts that sensor can introduce is uh, pixel non-uniformity or defect pixel. Uh, defect pixel is generally happens when uh, there's some fault in the uh, uh, in some of the photodiodes in the in the on the sensor plane, where some of them are always uh, turned on to very high value or specific high saturated value or are uh, turned off all the time. Uh, so detect uh, some of the these artifacts like pixel non uniformity can be rectified within the, uh, it's very similar to vignetting in some sense and can be corrected at the same place where we do vignette correction in the ISP. And, but, and there are some algorithms that we can use in the ISP to correct for defect pixels as well, where uh, the main thing is to detect uh, which pixels are actually defect pixels and uh, replace those pixels with uh, some value that is a blend of some neighboring pixels around uh, that defect pixel. One other artifact, uh, one, one other problems with uh, LDR sensor could be uh, simply capturing uh, the high dynamic range data uh, that actually exists in the real world scenario. So in this case, in general, most of the scenes are typically cover 120 uh, decibel of data, but there there can be a case where if you look at the end of this, this the it's basically 280 de decibel data where like there are very low light data at the edges, but and but the outside of the tunnel. Uh, basically, that everything is saturated, and that's also a problem because in the end, uh, most of the systems applications we use are basically uh, use twenty decibels of data and com compressing this uh, not twenty twenty to sixty yeah, at best, but compressing this two eighty decibels into something that's uh, useful at the end is, can be very, very hard if we just capture one image. If you remember from before, generally uh, the sensor itself it, uh, can capture up to 120 decibel. So how can we capture like in that case where the data was actually 280 decibels, how can we capture uh, all that data in just 120 decibels. One way to do that would be to use multi-exposure systems using a technique called temporal multiplexing, where we capture two images 
uh, one in low light, which would basically capture the go at the end, the, this part of the tunnel, which is low light region. And the other would capture this highlight region there. So we will change. In this case, we will alternate the exposure of the the sensor uh, from one cycle to another to basically capture two images and uh, convert uh, merge them together using a technique called uh, compending into a single image. Uh, it, th this is called framed stitching, which will basically give us a 24-bit data, uh, which in many cases is enough to capture most of the lighting uh, dynamic range of the real scene. But uh, as you can see here, we are using uh, two captures to basically merge them into one. This will effectively lower the uh, FPS of the camera system to half. Other way to avoid this could be to uh, use multiple photodiodes representing same pixels within the sensor itself. So there's one uh, sub-pixel here, which is capturing uh, long exposure data, this one, and other is capturing low exposure data. And the sensor itself in that case with for the same uh, for the same, uh, it's capturing both time, uh, values at the same time and merging it with the, in that case, the FPS doesn't need to be lower. But some of the artifacts using these two methods that uh, the ISP, the, the camera system can introduce would be ghosting. This happens when we are merging multiple images into same, at the same time. And uh, you can imagine if the car is moving very fast, there can be a lag between those two uh, captures, which will introduce such artifacts. The other artifact that it can introduce is SNR discontinuity. If you look here, this region is coming from a uh, high exposure data and this region is coming from a low exposure data. It's same here. So remo removing this is one of, uh, it's also challenging and one of the tasks of the ISP itself. So in the end, the third component of the camera subsystem which we are going to uh, be using uh, for optimization purpose in the, in the following slides is the ISP, which has to uh, deal with all these artifacts and convert the real world uh, data, real world uh, sensor data into something that's uh, it's good for you for human viewing or for computer vision tasks. The, H, the image, image signal processor itself generally have a multiple algorithms within it, like demosaicing, denoising, sharpening, lens shading correction, which is basically correcting for vignetting that uh, the artifact we saw earlier, defect pixel correction, which uh, which solves the problem the defect pixels on the uh, on the sensor global tone mapping, local tone mapping, white balancing, color correction, and decompending. The raw data that the sensor captures, the sensor itself has, uh, if you check before, if you look at this image, so each pixel is actually measuring a uh, different uh, uh, different colors uh, from the uh, from the light it's uh, it's captured. So one in this case, the raw image is uh, captured with a bear pattern of BGGR here, where uh, this pixel is measuring the blue 
uh, blue color in the light. This uh, pixel is measuring green. This is measuring green. This is measuring red. So this is a single plane image which contains all the uh, color, all the colors on different, all three colors on different pixels, different locations on the sensor plane. But the image, so if you look at the data here, this is what the, the raw image out of the sensor generally looks like. But we don't uh, uh, use that image directly uh, when we look at an image on a monitor or when we pass this data into the computer vision. What we want it out of the ISP is a RGB image where we have uh, uh, R, G, B separated in different channels of the image. So this it needs to basically convert this image, th this single channel image into some, uh, into three channels here. Yeah. So that's the job of the demosaicing algorithm. So for this, in this case, the bare pattern here is G, R, B, G. So R pixels are all these. So now it needs to fill up all these values with, with some value for the R, red color. And same thing here green channel is repeated twice. So we have double the amount of data, but it still need to find out proper values of these missing pixels to formulate the green channel in the final RG. And same thing for the blue. One uh, simplest way to do that would be uh, to do some kind of bilinear interpolation, where basically, let's say it has the values of these two pixels here, it will just average out these two to get the value of this pixel. And same thing, it will do averaging of this and this to get the, this middle value. So you can see a sort of a gradient that is introduced by bilinear interpolation, basically in mosaic. But one problem could be if we have edges, Let's say the real data was this, where there was an edge in this between the first and the second row here. But what we measured was basically this pixel, this pixel, this pixel, and this pixel. On doing this, the interpolation in this way, the average of these two will be same. That's why you will get uh, same values throughout this row and same values throughout this row. But when it will do averaging here, it will make, convert it into basically two edges here because of bilinear demosaic. De but the, in the actual real data, there was no, uh, th there was only single edge here and both these uh, values were actually the same. One way to, uh, so in the end, the bilinear demosaicing is not an ideal way to uh, do interpolation and get those missing pixels as uh, it fails to actually detect the sharp edges here. Most of the demosaicing algorithms generally use uh, various filters of different sizes and uh, to detect edges at, uh, in different directions. One such filter would be the seven cross seven uh, similarity kernel which basically is detecting this edge here uh, to correctly interpolate it here. So most of the, uh, the demosaicing algorithms would generally contains these filters with, of different sizes and different uh, weights to detect different, uh, uh, different angular edges, basically. Uh, some would detect a uh, horizontal edge, some would detect vertical edge or some very, undirectional edges or at some angle like 45 degree and basically blend them together with the uh, uh, bilinear demosaicing or uh, not to interpolation at those edges. So 
all these uh, factors in these these demosaicing algorithms can be seen as the hyperparameters uh, of the uh, of the demosaicing algorithm. One way, if the demosaic algorithm is very strong, it can also interpolate noise sometimes. So it's very critical to have, uh, especially in computer vision tasks, where we don't want to introduce some uh, data that information about edges that's actually not in the real data. So getting these the parameters in this these for these filters correctly, or for the branding factors of these filters correctly is very critical for various tasks. Uh, that's where the value of ISP optimization also comes into picture. Other important uh, part of a uh, ISP is a denoising algorithms. One uh, well-known method is basically called non-local means denoising, which basically uh, distributes the image into uh, various blocks. And for each block, it, uh, it finds the neighboring blocks and uh, based on the different values uh, of how uh, these blocks correlate with each with the center block, uh, it finds the uh, averaged out value for, uh, for the center block if they are not too dissimilar. So generally, uh, this method has various parameters like the patch size or block size, patch distance, noise estimate parameter, and a weight decay. And based on different uh, values of these parameters, or based on whether noise estimation was done or not, uh, you can, if the denoising is very uh, uh, very strong, it can actually get rid of some of the texture as well. Like you can see here, this was the original image. You can see it's slightly it got rid of some of the uh, some of the texture here as well. Compared to this, this the no, this was this has a lot less noise, uh, slightly more texture as well. And then you can do some sort of blending with the uh, algorithm. There are some complex algorithms where you can do some blending with different uh, weight decay parameters and all that. So even there, uh, you don't want to introduce some, uh, you, you, you want to reduce noise up to a point where it doesn't start losing actual textures. And here the, uh, value of finding proper values of of these different parameters is also very critical for different tasks. Something like uh, for human viewing, where for uh, ge general camera, in most cases we want to get rid of more and more noise, even if we lose slightly more texture is generally fine. But in computer vision applications, losing information can uh, create a lot of problems in the, uh, with low performance of the uh, downstream task. So it's also application dependent as well. So this is the example of a commercialized ISP called R Mali C71. Uh, which is uh, used by a lot of uh, other companies in, in, uh, for various automated driving uh, systems. So these uh, ISPs, I, I don't know if you can see different blocks here, but uh, generally in this case, you have a, very, a lot of like 20 plus algorithms throughout the ISP. We start with the uh, 16 to, uh, up to 20 with four channel data. We can get frame stitching and some 
after decompending we, we generally have up to 24 bits of data here at the with the compending here uh, before digital gain it was 24 bit linear data here and after compending it's reduced to 16 bit here which is passed through this uh, Sinter algorithm, which is noisy uh, denoising algorithm, and you have vignetting tone map with local tone mapper and local tone mapper here, and at the end you have a 14-bit data. So all these, this data, for like this can be up to 80-bit here because all these can be different exposure data with each channel of 20 bits. All this is reduced to 14 bit. And generally, the output can be up to 14 bit, but in many cases, it's 8 bit for human viewing tasks. So, throughout this pipeline, we have lots of compressions that occur, compression of the data that occur throughout the pipeline. So, whenever we introduce some sort of compression of the information, we always lose some data because of uh, these pipelines are. Yeah, are uh, quantized in a way. It's it's not in flow. So when whenever you compress, uh, the quantization uh, itself goes bigger. So some of the data is always goes missing, no matter what we do. So it's very critical, depending on the application, uh, to know what data is actually more important. And optimize this whole pipeline based on uh, what the end uh, downstream task. Some of the blocks in the ISP itself, uh, one main block in the ISP center denoising block contains like various uh, filters which, uh, which have parameters for uh, detecting uh, high frequency and low frequency uh, spatial data in, in horizontal and vertical directions. And there are some blend parameters, which are these strength one and four, or these high frequency, low frequency data. So it's basically applying multiple filters on the raw image data to and blending them together into a single data. One other block could be the demosaicing block uh, in this ISP, which has various filters. As I said earlier, this the VH filter here is detecting the vertical and horizontal edges, and it is de detecting angular, and VA is basically uh, blending these two, and UU is basically undirectional. Uh, edges. So we have lots of filters with a lot of parameter within this single block that we need to find our proper values for. So one thing is uh, all these are basically the registers of the ISP. Now we need to abstract it into something uh, that we can actually optimize for. And that's where the concept of ISP parameters or hyperparameter come into picture. So you can imagine an ISP hyperparameter as a, a control knob for the ISP, uh, which can uh, be formulated from one or more uh, registers of the ISP and is used to control various uh, algorithms of the ISP output image. Some of the examples of a parameter here would be this gain parameter or offset parameter, which is taking 14 bits of this particular register in the ISP. There could be multiple uh, parameters within the same register as well, uh, where like this one is a setting to enable disable one of the lookup tables in the ISP. This one is for another lookup table. So they are kind of independent of each other. 
So we need to actually abstract out these into two different parameters instead of keeping this register as a single thing. The other, one other type of parameter could be this, uh, this output gamma load, which is basically a table uh, defining the output conversion, uh, output gamma correction uh, in the ISP. So sometimes in this case, there are 256 registers here. Sometimes it can be up to uh, 65,000 as well, where uh, we can't actually optimize for each of these registers separately. What we need to do here is to uh, parameterize this into uh, some sort of a gamma curve or uh, some new law based uh, curve or uh, different uh, Different companies like Adobe has their own uh, perceptual curve that basically you can formulate a curve and parameterize this whole table into one to five or six parameters. An example could be this simple curve, which is based on uh, a gamma parameter. And we basically treat this whole table with a single highest parameter, which is gamma. The next uh, thing in the ISP parameter definition is how we represent the value of the, these registers or the parameters here. As you can see in this case, this is a 32-bit parameter. So it's actually quantized into uh, 2 to the power 32 minus 1 different values here. 2 to the power 32 different values. So we don't have everything. Uh, it's not in flow. To, we don't have very high precision here. One example could be this CCM uh, RGB to RGB parameter, where we have eight bits representing the decimals and next eight bit for uh, integral value with only four bit bits being used for the to represent the integral value and one bit for the sign value. And these three bits are uh, not used. So if we look at here, let's say the sign bit is zero, or then, and all of these basically at that, when it's, it's zero, all of these linearly increase from zero to, uh, uh, to two to the power of uh, all these, when all of them are for F basically the highest values. But, uh, so this is going from zero to 15.996 when this bit is zero. But when this bit is one, although in ISP value, it's uh, in hexadecimal is zero X 8,000 to zero X 8 FFF when these are maximum with this one. Although this, these values in ISP representation are more than these, but in practice, they are actually representing negative values. So this some sort of discontinuity from this value to this value. And we can't actually optimize for this kind of parameter directly. One way to do that would be to represent, uh, to convert the, this representation into something uh, that varies monotonically in nature. So this is the actual representation. So we, what we can do is basically, this is maximum negative value when the sign bit is one, we can represent it as zero as this is actually minimum value, but in ISP representation is maximum and it's, and we can map this into something that looks like this, where we map the lowest value with the, with ISP value, which actually represent minimum value in the user uh, base and the highest value in the index with something that represents the maximum 
value in the user user equation. That way we can directly optimize over this representation instead of optimizing on the ISP representation. And uh, and it, it's varying monotonically and it is continuous in nature. Yeah, most of the ISP tuning that's actually done in the industry right now is generally done by experts uh, who have like vast knowledge of imaging systems or done and it's done for human viewing systems. With that, uh, generally, uh, have, the, throughout that, as it's not an uh, an end-to-end -end, uh, optimization, where the end task is not being taken into consideration, generally this introduces some sort of bias into the system. And this whole process can take multiple months to get some reasonable values of parameters. And in many cases, the parameter search space for the ISP can be up to 1,000 parameters, from 100 to 1,000. And most, most of them, the blocks itself are generally not well correlated. So it's very hard to find a very uh, good optimal value and most most of these expert viewing cases due to not taking in uh, into consideration the end uh, user task especially in case of computer vision these uh, most of the these experts are generally uh, trained for human viewing tasks so all the biases for that sub, that system are also occur whenever a camera is deployed for for an automated driving camera for the for computer vision task there. One other way uh, that some uh, uh, some com uh, some experts uh, optimize the ISP is basically they optimize each block one at a time and they cycle through this multiple time, get it up to 80%. Uh, of subjective evaluation values, but generally there's some correlation between different blocks. Like sharpening and denoising de blocks are known to be very correlated with each other. And if we optimize for this denoising part, it basically uh, makes the optimization for sharpening uh, very le less effective. It and it's basically getting biased because of uh, optimizing the denoising uh, block separately. To, so to, especially in case of computer vision task, with all the biases that come due to optimization of the uh, ISP for human vision, uh, this can uh, sometimes uh, in the edge cases can lead to some safety related problems that are actually coming out of the ISP as well. So uh, there's one uh, recent algorithms uh, that, that optimizes this whole, the whole uh, imaging pipeline based on uh, an multi-objective algorithm that's working directly on the output of the computer vision task. Basically, in that case, what is done is basically they have a stack of up to from 200, from 100 to 1000 raw images uh, where you have a software model of the ISP. Where, and th then we can use the ISP to convert these raw images into RGB images, uh, use the computer vision application on it. Yeah. In this case, it's a, uh, this is a street object detection task where it's basically detecting pedestrians and cars. So it will uh, do these detections. And based on the ground truth data we have for these raw images, we can evaluate multiple matrices on this data. 
Some of them can be IQ matrices uh, for human vision. Some of them can be directly measured on this, uh, on the output of the detection model. And we iterate over uh, this whole process multiple times uh, to find out the proper uh, parameter values of the ISP. The optimization uh, algor algorithm itself is uh, generally composed of uh, multiple different algorithms. Uh, one, uh, at first it goes on to multiple uh, loops of uh, Latin hypercube subsampling uh, and such page reduction. And at the end, uh, uh, CMAES-based optimization is done uh, to do single or multi-objective op optimization. Nested LHC itself, what is done is basically you have, we start with some, uh, some initial value. And based on this initial value, it takes various samples throughout this search space in, in a way that uh, more samples are taken towards the initial guess compared to, uh, uh, compared to farther away from the initial guess. And based on this sampling, uh, we estimate a uh, soft box for doing the ne next sampling. What soft box means here is the optimization algorithm is allowed to go outside of this bo box in the search space, but the probability, uh, the search space itself is mapped in such a way that the probability of the point landing on this box, within this box is much more higher than outside this box. If it was a hard box, uh, which are most of the uh, search space reduction uh, techniques, which most algorithms use, then it would be basically bound to this single, the same box here, which is estimated based on the LHC subsampling. Then we can go through with multiple steps of these uh, subsamplings and, uh, and and SSRT and find a, a final search space. Now this space in this example, we are showing just two uh, dimensions, but this could be up to hundred or thousand dimensions there, and it could be actually very large space there. And if if the uh, Latin hypercube subsampling and SSRT is not able to find uh, co correct correlations, this whole box can actually be very large as well. If you see in this example, at first it took uh, multiple samples with the center here. The, all these samples are everywhere around this space. Then it find out by uh, by uh, some probabilistic estimation that the best point exists around here and the soft box is this, this, around these green points. But when it did the subsampling, although most of the points are here, it also found it used one of the points from here. That's where the concept of soft box comes into picture. If it was a hard box, there won't be any point outside this cell space. And then it found out the, the best region to do the next search is in this blue region. But even then it, it can actually sample outside of the box, but with a very low probability. After we do uh, various steps of LHC and SSRT, uh, we use uh, an evolutionary strategy called co covariance matrix adaptation evolutionary strategy, which basically based on the point, let's say in this case, initially the best, uh, the point, best point or initial guess was here at the center of this. It does a Gaussian subsampling of the search space such that there's a probability of uh, of detecting, uh, of sampling 
points around the, the whole cell space such, uh, such that the center of the Gaussian is, uh, is the initial gas. And uh, we have a uh, initial sigma, which is basically the, uh, the in each dimension, it has the length of the variance of that Gaussian, uh, where it can sample based on the uh, probability value of that Gaussian, it can uh, sample throughout the season. So initially, it, when it sampled, it it didn't find very uh, correlation, uh, good correlations throughout this sample point. So it actually increased the variance of the in this particular direction, it, uh, it increased the variance of the Gaussian. So it, now it's sampled throughout this big region. Then it again uh, tried subsampling throughout this region. Then it found some good points. In the, this case, this is, this is the optimal region. It found some good points around here. So it, it starts reducing the variance of this Gaussian. And finally, it converges to a, sing, a very small uh, variance Gaussian. And that would be the final uh, estimated point. For computer vision itself, some of the commonly used uh, uh, matrices of, to generate loss function for optimization are uh, MAP, which is mean average precision, MAR mean average recall, and IOU loss, which is intersection over linear loss. What we have here is this few, the task of this object detection algorithm is to detect uh, this pumpkin kind of structure here. The ground truth is this view box and the algorithm measured this orange box. Based on the overlap and union, it basically measures the IOU, which is intersection over union. And based on that, it uh, it's, it marks some points as precision and uh, uh, some points as uh, false positive, some points as true negatives and uh, does a, a precision recall calculation for different classes and takes the mean uh, at that particular IUU threshold. So one example of ISP optimization using the proposed, this, this framework would be uh, where uh, we did uh, our Mali C71 uh, simulator optimization for ResNet 101 object detection. So this particular uh, CNN was actually detecting uh, automotive objects like pedestrians and cars. Uh, and as this was a software simulator, we used 90 different instances and this did an optimization 2000 trials. And as you can see at the starting, we used, this, uh, we used the starting point as some, uh, something that was expert tuned. And we got up to, uh, we got about 60 to 70% improvement in the detections. So this is how it looks like when the ISP optimization is done. So although I'm showing just four images here, generally this data set can be up to thousand images. So as you can see, it's optimizing for something that's, that may not be good for humans, human being. What it did was it's, it basically found that at the higher end, at high uh, luminance, it's, uh, the pic it compressed quite a bit more. That's why you see a lot of saturation on the red channel here as well. And, sky is getting saturated as well. But basically it's compressing over the highlight. And uh, as we have the output itself is 8-bit, 
and the data input data was 14 bit in this case the same sensor data it expanded the low light data here so all the information uh, it, it expanded the bits where most of the information was present in the sensor data into the bits of the isp data so that it can actually detect uh, use more and more information from the sensor data which is actually useful instead of using uh, the information present in the sky area but this one of the problems with this is basically this is using the bias that was introduced while training the the C, the computer vision algorithm itself the uh, optimizing the isp in this way we are actually separating out the downstream task with we, although we are using the downstream computer vision task for evaluating the performance of that particular isp configuration it's still sort of separate from the downstream task. So we, we as the CNN weights of the CNN computer vision model were kept fixed here, one way to do uh, avoid this could be to uh, do a joint optimization of the ISP and CV model. But the problem with that would be the CNN itself can, can contain millions of parameters. And the optimization techniques that are used for the CNN fine tuning or optimization are generally separate from, uh, are different than generally used stochastic gradient descent techniques. One way to do that would be to do various small optimization steps where one optimize, one, one uh, optimization step would be done for ISP optimization, then followed by CNN tune, fine tuning. And we repeat that process to get to a, a more unbiased point. So for this one, we basically take the raw images, image stack as the same as the other case. And uh, we measure the ISP output, convert it in basically get the RGB out, uh, output from this raw image stack and uh, measure the, uh, apply the C CNN algorithm on it. And basically we optimize the, first we keep this CNN weights fixed and optimize for, do a very small optimization of ISP and sensor parameters with just few treatments uh, while keeping CNN fixed. Then we follow that up with fixing the ISP and sensor and use stochastic gradient descent to some steps of stochastic gradient descent to do a fine tuning of the CNN model. And we repeat this process multiple times. One experimental uh, case where we used was basically used a 24 bit uh, HDR sensor, IMX490. Uh, and Renaissance RENAC HDR ISP simulator. And you can see this, this one is basically the first algorithm that we saw earlier where it was fixing the CNN weights and just optimizing for the ISP. And this is basically the converged results with the, this joint optimization. You can see, clearly see that it, with the joint optimization, it's actually detecting a lot more uh, objects compared to both expert tuned and uh, optimizing the ISP independent of the CV model. You can see here, yeah, there are a lot one more car here and in all the cases the expert team was much worse but you can clearly see this is a lot more saturated image and th this image looks a lot more uh, 
presentable for human being compared to all the others. Same with the low light data. You can get, you see a lot more detections in this joint optimization. And if you look at the MAP scores here, uh, for all the uh, all major uh, matrices, the the joint optimization actually resulted in more than uh, two hundred percent improvement in compared to expert team, and uh, more than sixty percent improvement from optimizing the IFP separately. And yeah, that's it. Is does anyone has any questions on it? Hello. Yes, we. Yes, anyone have any question? They can ask. Any questions, anyone? The students, you can ask any question if you have. Okay, I think no one is having any question. Thank you so much, Mr. Avinash, sir. Now I would like Chodi, sir, Thakur, sir, to give the vote of thanks. Chodi, sir. Okay. okay. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, good morning, everyone, to the one and all present here. Uh, it's my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks. Uh, indeed, it is an uh, honor for me to get the opportunity to thank you all. On the behalf of Graphic Era Dim Tobi University, Department of Electrical Engineering, and my own behalf, I extend a very heartly vote of thanks to all the valuable participants in the gathering, and especially Mr. Avinash Sarma, sir, Senior Imaging Scientist, at uh, Algolux, Toronto, Canada. Uh, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Avinash sir, uh, resource person of this expert lecture, for enriching our knowledge in the area of automatic, uh, automated camera system optimization for human vision and uh, computer vision. In fact, uh, as uh, uh, it is also discussed in uh, this expert lecture, uh, the real world scene have dynamic range, or you can say dynamic ranges that often exceed 120 dB, and in extreme cases, like tunnel exit in uh, direct sunlight, as you have seen in uh, his uh, presentation, uh, its uh, range will be uh, reached over to 200 dB. Therefore, existing sensor cannot capture this high dynamic range in a single shot. Therefore, HDR, or you can say high dynamic range image recovery for a dynamic scene is still a pressing issue because of its motion and different <laughs> voice characters. Uh, Myriads of research work carried out in this area, and I hope this lecture would be very fruitful to you all, uh, and you can also explore uh, the various aspects on in this research area, and you can also explore wavelet transform. It is very interesting. Uh, thank you so much once again, sir. Expert talk on such an emerging area of research. Uh, further, I must thank Dr. Parvez Saini.
sir and dr venu sagwan assistant professor for for the thank you sir thank you everyone uh, if you guys have any question uh, later on as well uh, i have shared uh, the presentation itself with venu ma'am uh, you can pass on uh, the question uh, to venu ma'am and she can pass it on to me and i can answer later on as well uh, and i'm also available on linkedin or uh, to direct contact by email you can ask me directly there as well yes thank you so much uh, mr avinash sir and if anyone uh, want to have ppt i will share with them you just contact me for that okay and if you have any question for that also you can contact me okay so thank you everyone i think we can finish this session now thank you thank you thank you everyone thank you thank you thank you